It's those greedy companies are making billions of dollars and they don't want to share. That's why we're out here now fighting for a contract. We're going to fight for it and we're going to win it. Or this portal will never open up again. From here to Houston. I'm not playing games here. Yeah. 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 what you guys do and they don't want the economy to shut down but they don't fully understand the job of the men and women who work that's here. the problem nobody knew what the longshoremen were we didn't get respected but now we will we now can. we will when they find out malls are going to shut down because goods can't come in right. car salesmen are going to get laid off well guess what everything that comes in this country comes from the containers off these ships that my men work and i want the world to know it they learned during don't, COVID. don't come after us saying we're greedy Go after those greedy that own these companies in Europe. Go after them. They're sitting over there taking four billion dollar bonuses for themselves at Christmas time. That's got to stop. You just heard from Harold Daggett, the president of the International Longshoremen Association, which is a union with 45,000 plus members that has the ability to grind the United States economy to a halt because this strike affects 36 shipping ports. So to say that this is a big deal would be the understatement of the century. But I think that Daggett's message there was perfect. If you're mad about the slowdown in goods and services, don't blame the striking workers. Blame the greedy corporations like Maersk, who can spare $6.5 billion for stock buybacks, but can't afford to pay their workers a fair wage, apparently. But I think that this is about more than just fair wages. It's also about protecting their jobs from automation. As Slade explains, the hottest items of contention here involve compensation and automation. Dock workers are responsible for difficult and often dangerous labor operating the cranes and trucks that transport and stock heavy containers onto the commercial barges that do business at the ports. As with so many other unionized industrial professions, the ranks of the stevedores have whittled from their early 20th century heights thanks to two major post-war developments. The containerization revolution, which optimized and sped up the packing and unloading of goods, and the rapid consolidation of the global shipping industry industry. Port watchers no longer have to spend days stocking up a ship with just the use of their hands, which is why those jobs are gone. But the dock workers of today have to be skilled, knowledgeable, and dexterous enough to ensure that the incoming freight trucks, the hefty equipment, the potentially hazardous cargo, and the boats themselves operate safely and smoothly throughout all the steps of the process. That premium on skill and labor added to the union's historic strength makes these dock workers the highest paid blue-collar workers in the country as the American prospect notes. Right now, ILA members' base hourly wage is $39 an hour, which they wish to gradually increase to $69 an hour over the next six years, constituting an eventual 77% raise. The latest offer from the Maritime Alliance was a 50% raise over that same time span. The argument from the dock workers is that shipping companies have made huge profits in recent years, true despite a significant bus cycle in 2023, and that in light of major cities' higher costs of living and worker compensation not keeping up with inflation, inflation, the union members deserve more of those earnings. So we're dealing with highly skilled laborers here who often face dangerous working conditions. And I understand that compared to you and I, a 77% raise might seem like a lot comparatively speaking. But when you contrast what they're asking for with the record profits that these corporations are seeing, I'd argue that it's actually a very reasonable ask, almost too reasonable. Because if these companies agree to their demands, the companies are still going to be incredibly profitable. Their CEOs will still be able to buy yachts and mansions, but the difference is that they won't be as rich. Oh no. But if these employees are the backbone of these companies and they're responsible for the wealth that they are generating, if they're the reason why these CEOs got rich in the first place and these companies can't generate profits at all without the workers, why should the fat cats at the top make all the money while the workers at the bottom who do all the work take an effective pay cut over time as inflation goes up. It's incredibly unfair. And to add insult to injury, the Maritime Alliance is trying to eventually devalue and displace these workers by increasing automation with automated trucks, automated cranes, and other self-operating robots that require less humans. And the workers are taking a clear stance now while they can, and they're saying we're against automation full stop. And I think that's also a very reasonable demand. But to be clear, all work is dignified and every single worker in this country should be paid a living wage regardless of what they do and where they work. But a lot of Americans have the tendency to 
degrade or even minimize the importance of certain jobs like fast food work, for example. We always talk about McDonald's workers as if that's some bad thing, but that is a legitimate job, right? So these workers who are supposedly non-essential are also really important. And I just want to implore everyone to never play into that game and treat all work as if it's important because it is all work is legitimate and to suggest otherwise is to engage in class warfare against people that's on our side right we should have class class solidarity because the people at the top they certainly have class solidarity and they win when we're divided at the bottom so don't play into their game uh because that's that's how we all lose now there is some skepticism about the strike in large part due to its timing and given the relationship between daggett and Donald Trump. Yes, I just said Donald Trump. So Newsweek explains in November, Daggett met with Trump at Mar-a-Lago, which he called a wonderful and productive meeting. President Trump promised to support the ILA in its opposition to automated terminals in the U.S. Mr. Trump also listened to my concerns about federal right to work laws, which undermine unions and their ability to represent and fight for its membership, Daggett said. Now, he told us about this November meeting after Trump was uh, nearly assassinated the first time. And he also said that they've known each other for decades decades since they both are from Queens. And um, a lot of people, namely liberals online, have pointed this out and they're saying, hmm, is this some sort of a rat fuck going on because it's this close to, to the election? And if this strike does go on for an extended period of time, it's going to put Biden and Harris in very, very difficult positions because it will absolutely have severe economic consequences. And as the strike begins to impact other working Americans, which is inevitable if it does happen, Biden will face increased pressure from Republicans, from Donald Trump, from everyone to invoke the Taft-Harley Act and break up the strike. Now, it's kind of a lose-lose situation for Biden because if he doesn't break the strike, he'll be accused of standing with these dock workers at the expense of every other working American who is being harmed by the strike right before the election. But if he gives in and he breaks the strike, he'll be attacked for not standing in solidarity with labor. So there are some people who are skeptical about the motives of Harold Daggett. There's also criticism about his income, he has a mansion, there's been photographs of it with a five-car garage. But listen, here's what I will say. This is a common tactic used against union leaders, and regardless if you think they make too much and they're too wealthy and they're hypocrites, what they're advocating for is what their workers need. So what I would say is put aside your differences with the union leader and think about what's best for the workers, because regardless if the union boss is rich, that is not the same about workers. They're struggling right now because of inflation, and they've effectively taken a pay cut since the company has not increased wages. And I don't necessarily blame people for being skeptical because there's a lot of fuckery that goes on in American elections. So I understand why people see this and they're suspicious of Daggett. But just because you're suspicious of him doesn't mean you should be suspicious of the workers and think that their asks are illegitimate, right? And again, I understand that other union leaders aren't great. Sean O'Brien, for example, of the Teamsters, he was chumming it up with Republicans after Democrats literally voted to save their pensions. No Republicans voted for that. Democrats did, and he still snubbed them for Donald Trump. But I don't think that the situation is cut and dry. And I say this because back in 2020, the ILA actually endorsed Biden and Daggett praised Biden back then and said that, you know, uh, he supported Biden and Biden supported him and they had a friendship. Now, this time, the union hasn't made an endorsement of either party, although the ILA has donated more than $100,000 to Democrats and just 5000 to Republicans, which is 5000 too much. But nevertheless, it's clear that they do seem to have a preference. Now, Harold is the only one who knows what's in his heart. We don't know if he's a secret Trump supporter who's trying to time the strike with the election to maximize impact. But even if we're overly cynical here and assume that he's timing the strike to do just that, it doesn't and shouldn't take away from the fact that this is a very righteous cause. And as leftists, we should always stand in solidarity with striking workers. Having said that, though, I actually don't think that Daggett is doing this as some sort of an underhanded ploy to help elect Donald Trump. I could be wrong, but I say this because he praised the Biden administration in an interview with Fox News, actually. And when they tried to spin this as, oh, well, you know, what if the strike causes harm as opposed to the corporations causing harm? He shut that shit down immediately. Over the weekend, the Secretary past of Labor Julie Sue has been terrific. 
She's knocking, knocking down doors. She's trying to stop this. She's trying to get us to a media where we can have a fair negotiations. It's the companies that don't want to. They don't want to sit here and be fair. So that's why we're out here fighting for our livelihood. What more from the automation do you want? What more protections could there be? What more? Yeah, they have language in there now. Not strong enough, because what happens is they come in with new technology. We just caught them in Mobile, Alabama, called AutoGate. Right. And that means right. the trucks are coming in and they're already checked in somewhere else and not using the checkers in the ILA. Circumventing the contract. Circumventing the contract. They don't care. They don't care. See, it's folks. not fair. And if we don't put our foot down now, they would like to run over us. And we're not going to allow that. You are going to grind the economy to a halt here on the East Coast and the no, Gulf no, Coast. No, 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 it's not us. They, they are. Don't spin it now because you're Fox News. <laughs> They're going to drive it. But are you worried? They're going to drive it. Are you worried that this they strike... They have the capital to settle this thing. Are you worried that this strike is going to hurt the everyday American, the farmers that need to reach the, reach the export market? They're Listen, telling me that they're going to hurt through all of this. Now you start to realize who the longshoremen are, right? Nobody cares People about never them. gave a about us until now, when they finally realized that the chain is being broke now. Cars won't come in. Food won't come in. Clothing won't come in. You know how many people depend on our jobs? Half the world. And it's time for them and time for Washington to put so much pressure on them to take care of us because we took care of them and we're here 135 years and brought them where they are today and they don't want to share. And that right there is such an important point that I want people to remember because we've all kind of been conditioned to blame striking workers for the inconveniences that ensue as a result of strikes. But it something that we shouldn't do because that mentality right there is asymmetric class warfare. Again, we should have class solidarity if the people at the top have class solidarity. And we shouldn't blame the striking workers for whatever inconveniences their strike may cause. We should understand that it's the companies who we have to blame exclusively because they could end the strike immediately like that. In fact, they could prevent the strike from happening in the first place if they just met the reasonable demands of their workers. But I do agree that this could potentially be damaging to Democrats, uh, but it doesn't have to be the case, right, if they handle this the right way. That's key. And so far, I do think that they're navigating this really well. Biden, for example, has vowed to stand with striking workers, saying it's collective bargaining. And he adds, I don't believe in Taft Hartley. Now, let's not pretend like he didn't break up the railroad workers strike because he did do that. But to be fair, I am relieved to see him take this stance. In fact, Harris echoed the same sentiment, and she used it as an opportunity to call out Donald Trump's terrible record on labor, saying Donald Trump wants to pull us back to a time before workers had the freedom to organize, she said. As president, he blocked overtime benefits for millions of workers. He appointed union busters to the NLRB. And just recently, he said striking workers should be fired. So even if you are skeptical of Daggett because of his association with Donald Trump, Understand that this is something that doesn't necessarily have to be a political loss for Biden and Harris. In fact, they're turning it into a dub because at least for now, they're handling this as they should handle it, right? They're standing with labor and that's everything we could ask for. The question is, will they buckle under pressure? And to that, we'll just have to wait and see because if the strike really does go on for an extended period of time, if their dem demands are not met, we are going to see all of the so-called right-wing populists show their true colors real fast. And they're going to demand that Biden break the strike immediately and they'll attack him. So I think that this is going to be a true test to see which politicians are actually pro-labor and which ones aren't, which ones are full of shit. But the Labor Department, they're trying to make sure that it doesn't even come to that, which is why they're trying to bring the corpos to the table. And that's why, you know, Daggett commended the Biden administration's Labor Department for trying to assist them and standing with them. But let's talk about Donald Trump, because this also could affect him as well. It's not just a loss for Biden and Harris, because sure, he can try to sit back and play both sides. But at the end of the day, if you say you're pro-labor, well, now's the time to put up or shut up. So he was asked about striking workers and he had the chance to unequivocally stand with them and uh, walk the walk. Let's see how he did. It's a big deal. Look, Americans are already struggling with inflation under yep. Kamala Harris. How does this supply chain issue going to build up and once again be another disastrous economic uh, episode under Kamala Harris. It's massive. It's massive. Those workers are very important to the lifeblood of our country. And 
it's a massive thing. But don't forget, they've been hurt very badly with inflation. You know, those workers, uh, some people would be upset with them and some people not. But those workers were very badly hit with inflation. And, you know, they're not happy and they do a good job. And uh, they also don't want to see uh, certain new technologies, which in many cases don't work very well. I mean, you know, when they modernize ports, a lot of times it, it doesn't work. There's nobody to talk to. It's very inaccurate. I've heard a lot of complaints about these modernized uh, stations, a lot of very big complaints. But those are, are really hard workers. Uh, I know some of them. And uh, no, it's, that's going to be a tremendous, that's a tremendous hit. There's another one. Biden shouldn't have uh, let that happen. Not that he should have ended it. He should have worked out a deal between them and the others. He could have worked out a deal. That's an easy deal to work out in a sense because you have a certain power of being the, Uni the United States. A lot of these are foreign ship owners. And you have a lot of power being the U.S. And uh, that should have been worked out. Uh, it's a devastating event for the economy. It's also devastating for inflation because everything's going to cost a lot more because of it. I don't know how long it's going to go on, but I understand the workers. That. I mean, I've, I've seen both sides. These workers have been devastated by inflation, and the inflation was caused by energy, stupid energy policies, and equally as much by deadhead spending. And that's what they call it. They call it deadhead spending. You know why? Because stupid people do what they did. And that caused inflation. So they were badly hurt. Thank you. I'm sorry. That is not good enough. He was very noncommittal and he tried to empathize with the workers while not really taking a strong stance either way. So that way he has plausible deniability if he has to call for the strike to be broken up. But notice, though, he did say that he doesn't think that Biden should have ended the strike, meaning that he does agree with Biden, at least for now that it's good to not break the strike. So I want you all to save this clip because when things go south, if they go south and Trump starts attacking Biden for not breaking the strike, remember that he said the exact same thing. And for the record, the Biden administration, they are trying to work out a deal, even though he says they're not trying to work out a deal. But of course, Donald Trump is gonna attack Biden and blame him for literally everything. Now, I wanna quickly address his comments about inflation because of course he's blaming Biden and a lot of voters blame Biden as well, which isn't necessarily surprising. Whenever the economy goes south, voters look to who's in power and they blame them. But understand that inflation, that is not a unique phenomenon to the United States. We just experienced a global global supply chain crisis due to COVID. And to add insult to injury, large corporations decided to exploit that crisis and price gouge because they thought that they could get away with it because we would chalk it up to just regular inflation. Not spending money to mitigate the economic effects of the pandemic would have triggered a depression. But of course, Trump is trying to say that we're in this situation because of Biden, but presidents don't have that much control over the economy. They can steer the economy in certain directions, and for the most part, Biden could have done more and should have done more, but he steered it in the direction that he should have steered it in. You don't opt for austerity during times of crisis. You spend money to stimulate the economy and increase purchasing power of regular Americans. But in conclusion, I do hope that the demands of these workers are met quickly, and I will always, always stand with workers, and I hope that you do too. But if for some reason this goes on for an extended period of time, I want you all to resist the urge to blame the workers, even though pundits and mainstream media are going to tell you to do just that. The corporations and their greedy CEOs, they are always the ones to blame for these types of crises. Always. They are the reason why these strikes occur in the first place. If they were actually fair and treated their workers right, the strikes wouldn't even need to happen. So don't blame the workers, blame the corporations, blame the CEOs, because they are always the reason why these strikes happen.